welcome to the show, Joanna. Hey, Sarah. Great to be here. Thanks for I having am, me. I am super excited to have you on the show. I mean, creativity, sustainability, technology. There are so many things I want to ask you about, and the audience is just going to love your story. I mean, you and I have known each other for a few years now. We've supported each other on our journeys, and I just can't wait for the community to hear about you and how amazing you are, just how I've known how amazing you are for the last couple of years. So let's dive in. I love to take my guests back to the beginning, and women like you are the reason why. You have so much in your journey, from film school to health and wellness to fashion design, even hiring the first female welder at a large manufacturing plant. I'm intrigued. So take us on that journey. What does it look like? I've definitely pivoted a few times along the way, so that is for sure. Um, I'm going to start maybe with my schooling. I went to UBC um, for four years, and it was after that that I decided to go to film school, Vancouver Film School. And I learned, you know, awesome things there, like simple things like how to uh, tie cables to producing and directing and script writing and whatnot. So that was an awesome experience. Uh, from there, I went and worked in a digital animation um, film company. So I learned a lot about digital animation, and that was super cool. And then one day, I got a phone call from my dad, uh, and he was calling me from Winnipeg. I'm in Vancouver, and he said, Joe, I really, really want you to come back and work at the family business. Just give me three months of your time. Just three months is all I ask. So I thought about it and thought about it and I was like, well, it's really cold in Winnipeg and it's nice and, you know, it's nice in Vancouver where I am, but, you know, this is important to my dad, so I'm going to do it. And so I promised him I would come back for three months. Well, um, eight years later, <laughs> I'm still at the company. <laughs> and so in at that, at that company, uh, MacDon, I worked in HR the entire time, starting out in payroll, doing the, time, the punch cards. Um, and then I went into some health and wellness. There was no health and wellness program at the time at this large manufacturing facility. And so, you know, we made, uh, we implemented such things as like a healthier menu in the cafeteria, um, a right. dragon boat team. Um, I mean, we did virtual golf on the break times in the summertime. Uh, we set up gym membership discounts. I mean, I could go on and on about just my boss gave me, my HR director gave me free reign, like anything I could dream up uh, um, as far as, as health and wellness. She was like, you do it, Joe, you go. So I had great support in that, um, in that eight years from my HR director. And um, so I guess um, at a certain point during that journey, as you mentioned, um, we, were, we were on a hiring spree, so we could not get enough warm breathing bodies. That's what we used to call them, warm breathing bodies and skilled labor in our, our plant. And so we were desperate for welders. And so uh, one day I was doing my interviews. I used to, you know, at sometimes I would interview 10 people in a day. And, um, and so this girl came in and applied checked over her resume, um, met with her, super nice, great personality, did her reference checks, and then informed the welding department that we were gonna be hiring the first female welder. Well, that didn't go over so well. And so, um, at first anyways, so I just said, you know what guys, you want the you want the bodies, the warm breathing bodies, I'm giving them to you. And so sure enough, a couple weeks later, the head of the welding department came into my office with his head held, you know, his head held low, and he said, you know what, Joe, she's the best welder we have. Wow. Hire more females. Love so that. It so it was so, and it was just so, um, it was just so cool because she's still there today. She's still kicking butt. Um, and, and the next step after starting to hire a lot more females in the plant was, you know, the maintenance department had to start building female washrooms and female locker rooms. And so it was a whole change in the environment and the landscape of the factory. And uh, I think the women are giving the men uh, a run for their money. <laughs> that is so awesome. I love that. And so how did you 
go from, I mean, it's, it seems like you throw yourself into every opportunity. I mean, you have qualifications at each stage and then it hasn't really been a linear journey for you, right? But ultimately it's right. not about a single destination. It's all about the journey. So how did you end up to find founding your own company and really putting an emphasis on supply chain? So I guess the next step from working at MacDon for those eight wonderful years, I learned a ton in different, um, you know, I, I got to learn so much when I was there and it was, it was just invaluable. Um, but there came a time when, you know, I was like, I don't want to live in the coldest city uh, on the planet, which one year was, <laughs> was recorded as colder than Mars. And um, I wasn't necessarily sure that I wanted to work in, you know, a manufacturing environment for the rest of my life. So I sat down and, and um, you know, chatted with my dad and I was like, dad, I think it's time for me to make a change. I want to do something more creative and typical dad style. Uh, he was like, Joe, what are you thinking? I was like, well, I think I want to go away and study handbag design. Um, you know, going back to when I was a kid, my grandmother used to take me out for, and she loved handbags. So really I can attribute my interest in handbags to my grandmother. And she loved everything from luxury, expensive handbags to, you know, the, the handbags that we would uh, pick up when she would take me to Tijuana. And so she loved going to Tijuana and meeting the artisans and the families along the strip where you can buy, you know, different types of goods. So she just loved to meet the families and the especially the kids. She would love when the kids would come out from behind like the booth and the, the parents would introduce their children. And she took such an interest in the families and into the people that were making these handbags. And so she would barter um barter them down on the cost but then she would pay them you know double so that was it was just interesting how she enjoyed the process she enjoyed getting to know the people making the, the product and i took a lot from that i mean i didn't realize until later in life how much i took away from that but um it really is all about the people um and so i'm sure we're gonna get to that in, at a certain point but you know really business and especially in the fashion industry is evolving and changing and really uh, heading in a direction of collaboration and focusing on, you know, people being treated fairly and all of those good things. Yeah, absolutely. And supply chain is all about people along the way, right? In every single aspect. And so you're currently founder and creative director of Piper and Sky. So tell us a bit about that. I mean, I love that it sort of comes from a family tradition and things that you used to do with your grandmother. So tell us about Piper and Sky, what you do, and, you know, what made you set up this business in particular? Sure. And, um, you know, I am, I have to say, I'm really proud of the business that I have set up, and I'm proud of the journey that it has been because I... I can say with a lot of confidence, no regrets. Um, I just knew from day one that I wanted to keep my supply chain close to me because I learned through my time at MacDon um, that getting to know, you know, at MacDon it was getting to know the, the dealership network, but for me it was getting to know my raw material suppliers and, and the people that were making my product, the manufacturers. And so I knew when I moved from Winnipeg to Toronto that the next closest place to me would probably be New York to have the manufacturing of my bags. And so um, it's been awesome working with the factories. And of course, coming from a manufacturing plant, I'm super comfortable in a factory environment. So I can walk into those handbag factories and no problem, right? I know it feels at home. So, um, so I would say that, yeah, I'm very proud of the supply chain that I've set up. I've kept it very tight. Most of my suppliers come from within North America. Um, one of my raw materials comes from uh, South America. It's tanned in Brazil. And so that, that's one of the things on my, on my list for 2022 is to get over there and actually, you know, boots on the ground. I want to see the tannery and I want to meet these people that are, that are tanning our fish leather. And I want to really see with my own eyes. I really want to go back to the beginning of that supply chain and where yes. the fishermen, how the fishermen are fishing, and how the surrounding communities are affected by the fisher by the fishing in fisheries industry. So I just really love knowing everything about my business. I don't necessarily want to just hire someone to take care of my supply chain and and sourcing and like I want I want to be part of every aspect of it, and I would like to have relationships with all of my raw material suppliers 
and with the manufacturers and a lot of them just happen to be um, organically and innately sustainable whether or not they intended to be they just that's how they do business and a lot of them also tend to be um, family-run businesses which of course I love so yeah I, I'm really I love happy. that I love that. And origin stories are super important, right? So I hope when you do that, you'll go and take a lot of video and post it all over Piper and Sky social media to talk about that origin story and where that product comes from. Because honestly, you are so inspiring in how you've set up your supply chain, how you are you know, involved at every step and how that origin story really makes a product. I mean, you have been featured uh, and Piper and Sky have been featured in all sorts of, you know, amazing publications purely because of what you stand for. And so let's get into that. What does socially responsible, transparent, sustainable pieces mean to you? And why is it so important? I mean, I had Tara St. James on the show last year, and there were a couple of big make or break moments for her that pushed her towards a passion for sustainability and a more ethical supply chain. Was it like that for you? Like, tell us about this whole concept. So I would say going back in time, um, before sustainability was even a thing, um, I, I was sort of just, you know, I was dreaming and visualizing how to build my company and what, what I, I uh, see it as becoming. And so taking what I've learned from my family, who are all businessmen, and, and the success of our family business in this manufacturing of harvesting equipment, um, I, was, I was lucky enough to watch how they operated the business and how you know um, owners of a company so large of 1700 employees um, know everybody's name on the shop floor they know their wife's name you know everyone gets a turkey at christmas every it's it's a family it's a big family but it's a family so i knew that that's how i wanted to build my company and not just on my own team but all throughout every step of the way and so i um i also was fortunate enough to watch how the employees were treated at this company, large company. So um, employees were treated with respect and dignity and paid fairly, uh, given the appropriate you know, vacation time. And if someone had a family emergency, it was never ever a question that you know family comes first. And so I was, that's just kind of how I built my business. And then I started to learn about you know, some of the environmental impact of, of leather period, and also especially of exotic leathers. And I can even make reference to when you and I, when I was, uh, you know, looking into using fur and you took me to, to a fur auction. Mm -hmm. So it was sort of an organic journey of like, you know what, with the fur, I was like, I don't know if I could sleep at night. So I put that aside. And then I started looking into other leathers and other materials and then discovered this uh, sustainable, uh, it's called Piruku, and it comes from uh, South America. Uh, and it's the largest uh, freshwater fish on the planet it grows to be about 10 feet long and wow. so it's it's a food source primarily and so i loved that and i just felt like I, it was i felt comfortable i could sleep at night using this raw material and the suppliers from the tannery um when i interacted with them i felt like it was just a good fit you know and so it wasn't really um something i was aware of being sustainable or ethical it was just kind of an organic process and an organic journey but i also have to have to give recognition to the entrepreneurs and the emerging brands right now that are coming into the game and coming into this industry where there's so much pressure to be sustainable and so it's a, it's different because they're they're coming into the game knowing that they have to be sustainable whereas i kind of organically just became um someone who you know, really cared about those things. And so it's a different kind of vibe, I guess, but um, lots of credit to our industry. I know that we've gotten a lot of, you know, a lot of shaming for our waste to the amount of waste that we produce. And I think that the industry in general, fashion industry and the luxury goods industry has really stepped up um, to, to pay attention and to be aware of the impact that we are having as an industry on the environment and on the climate. So. Yeah, absolutely. And that really does, you know, everything that you spoke about really does set you apart. 
And what you mentioned is that we really are in the midst of a fast fashion crisis, right? That's why the industry gets a little bit of a bad name because of all the fast fashion and because of what it does to climate change and environment. So how can brands like yours innovate in the industry, right? Maybe, or champion sustainability and transparency and maybe help move the needle. Is it about the origin story and really going back to the origin and making maybe making some changes if needed? or or what does that really look like um so i have a few things i would like to say on this um i would like to say uh first of all i mean there's there's certain things that uh someone coming in a new a person coming into the industry at this point in time um is not forced to look at but really um you kind you kind of have to so we're talking about the 17 un uh, sdgs sustainable yeah. development goals and then the ESGs, which are, um, you know, also crucially important. And so I can say that from, from my point of view, we have started looking and I just recently learned of a term called CI, climate intelligence. And so the climate intelligence I'm trying to build within my organization um, start, starts with the 17 SDGs. And so how we've approached that is we looked at the whole list of the 17 and we were like, you know what, this, this one doesn't apply to us. Uh, this one, perhaps we can have an impact on whether it's, you know, small or large, but it's at least something. So we went through the list and we kind of checked off the, the ones that we thought were applicable to us or the ones that we thought we could make a diff even a small difference on. Yeah. And then the rest we left out. And I think that's the that's the understanding and the and the shared agreement between, you know, in, in the industry is that you can't tackle all 17. So you really have to pick and choose a couple and really do your best to make a, a genuine impact there. Um, I will say next that um, circularity is a huge topic right now, mm -hmm. and we are struggling with circularity. So what's the end of life look like for a handbag that we sell? And so there's a few different options for us anyways. I'm just going to use us as an example, but we can do uh, buybacks or trade-ins, you know, and, and so say a customer wants to trade back or, or us to buy back um, a product from say a season or two ago and wants to buy what's current and new so maybe there's uh, a negotiation there that happens and then we can take that bag and decide whether we resell it or we donate it to charity or we you know deconstruct it and put it into a churning machine of some kind and it spits out a whole new leather material so we're looking at different ways to solve that circularity problem um, I would say also very important is that transparency uh, in this, in everything you do. Transparency in who you work with, why you work with them, you know, how you treat your employees. Do you have a code of ethics, a code of conduct, a harassment policy? So these are all things that we have been learning and drafting. And um, so I would say uh, that, that transparency is crucial. But really what I'm seeing most um, most these days in the articles I'm reading is traceability. And that comes back to supply chain as going back to the root. So again, it's origins. And I do have a couple of funny stories about this. Um, so it's been a longstanding invitation for me to go down to Louisiana and meet with the actual the fishermen and also the uh, meat distributors. So for the alligator that comes from the southern New, uh, United States, uh, there's a long-standing invitation and of course we have to stay at their home and be hosted you know good old southern hospitality and um and go out on the fishing boats and meet the fishermen and and then learn about the meat distribution and and know with my own eyes that it is truly sustainable because it is used as a food source primarily right. and the skins would, be, would otherwise be a byproduct so we are making use of what otherwise would be a waste product and we're making beautiful handbags out of it and so that's just one example for me of traceability and again going back to the the upcoming trip to brazil it's i want to see with my own eyes so that i can sleep at night that the workers and the whole the whole supply chain everyone's happy everyone's healthy and treated fairly that's so important to me and i think that um everyone is really taking notice of that importance right now absolutely so inspiring and there's a couple of things that i want to say there so you mentioned sdgs 
um, and starting with where you can make an impact, right? And taking a look at what's on there and what actually resonates with you. And that's something that I talk about in my LinkedIn learning course called Fundamentals of Sustainable Supply Chains, because it's so true. You've got to be able to start now, but you've got to start on what resonates and that you can put into action right away. And so that's a super, super important point. And then the traceability. I mean, we've got a live show with Topple, Purpose People Planet, with Topple, and they're talking about blockchain and sustainability and how you trace back to the origins using those technologies. And, you know, so many different organizations and companies and people are looking at that right now um, so that they can do what you did from the very, very get-go. You're not working backwards. You were very forward-thinking and front-thinking when you started the company. And I just love those examples and I appreciate you for sharing that. So sustainability and visibility are huge trends for 2022 and beyond, but so is e-commerce. And you have a part to play in that as well. You're an advisor for Runway Buy, which is a platform for shoppable vi video technology. Plus you're looking into earning your black belt in lean manufacturing. Um, and so talk us through some of the things that you're doing um, and why you're doing them and how they're going to affect what you're doing in e-commerce. E For sure. So I was lucky enough to be encouraged uh, during my eight years at MacDon towards the end to go and get my green belt in lean manufacturing, which is Six Sigma. And so it's really all, it's all about waste reduction and process efficiencies. And so as I look towards getting my black belt in 2022, I have learned that there is a black belt certification available for entrepreneurs and small business owners that really want to um, focus on their supply chain. So it'll have nothing to do with manufacturing for me this time uh, when I when I go to do the black belt training. It'll really have to do with like a fo like a really really focus on my supply chain. So I'm excited about that. Um, and I just love I just love uh, learning and. Um, it doesn't, I was going to say too, it doesn't really hurt, you know, if you're approached in a back alley, you can just throw out, you know, hey, I got my black belt, so you might, you might not want to. They don't need to know that it's not martial arts, right? They don't need to know. It's just in lean manufacturing, but sh you leave that part out. <laughs> I love that. But I am excited to, to really focus on supply chain because I look as, as a to expand and work with um, suppliers from other countries and manufacturers, you know, in my in my own backyard, even in uh, North Toronto. And so I'm going to have to start really, really um, nailing down uh, what's important to me in that supply chain and how the impact of my supply chain, you know, what the impact has on the global situation with the climate crisis. And so we're just at a point now where we are uh, establishing our own baseline, our environmental impact as a company, as a brand. And then once we have that established, then we can start to set goals for the future. You know, So our one year goal is to reduce our impact by this much. And then once we've got a handle on that, we're gonna expand that through, throughout our supply chain. And so that'll be exciting and I have a lot to learn. Um, but I think it's very crucial and it's fun. <laughs> yeah, it's so um, important, so important. Yeah, the other thing you asked about uh, Black Belt and what was the other Runway thing? Runway Bay. Asked? Runway Bay, yes. Okay, so. Bay, yeah, um, sorry. Runway Bay, yes. And so I'm just going to look at my notes here. I got a current update, status update today on that. Um, and so I wanted to uh, make sure I don't get this incorrectly here. Um, so Runway Bay is a digital shopping platform. Um, and it is an opportunity for uh, consumers and emerging brands to come together and um, interact. And so it's also very encouraging of collaborations. And so we've already started, you know, it's still in it's just finished beta test phase. And so we're in pre-launch at, at the moment. Um, but it's a very, uh, it's a platform that's very encouraging of collaboration and it allows like a brand from Australia that's maybe, maybe a bathing suit company or a swimwear company to collaborate with a handbag company. We've already done that. So, uh, it's really cool because the future of this industry is collaboration. Um, but it's been super interesting because I've been able to listen in on a lot of the phone calls with the developer team, which is based in Australia. And so I'm not a tech person. But I have learned so much about uh, APIs and 
um, or, you know, virtual reality, um, artificial reality, chat bots, um, you know, there's so much exciting stuff happening in tech for fashion and in digital innovation. Um, I had a hard time. I struggled at one point when one of my teammates came to me and said, Joe, I think we should be in gaming. And I was like, what and how and what? Right. <laughs> And so she explained, I was like, gaming, how does that work with, with what we do? So it turns out we are working with Covet Fashion. It's, an, it's a downloadable app. And um, it's basically, you know, a format where there's a mannequin and you dress the mannequin and you pull from different brands. And so, you know, when it gets to the handbag or the accessories, they can pull a Piper and Sky bag on this game. Nice. And so this company, Covet Fashion, has millions of, of followers and engagers and gamers. And so it's actually brought us a lot of traffic. And I was like, I was very skeptical at first. I was like, mm, no, we're not doing that. But uh, the more that I learn about the gaming and the gaming industry and how fashion can, fit, how luxury fashion and accessories can fit into uh, all, all these emerging digital um, platforms, it's pretty exciting times right now. And of course, we were catapulted into it um, during the pandemic to move towards digital e-commerce and whatnot. So I have a lot to learn. I mean, there is never ending um, emerging e-commerce platforms that are just coming out every single day. And so it's a team, it's a team effort to stay on top of what is current, what's the best and where we, where it make, makes most sense for us to be present on. And so um, I take a lot of advice from people that are experts in that area. <laughs> Well, and it just goes to show that you've built an amazing team around you, that they're looking for different opportunities and turning them into realities for you and, and sort of upping what you're doing. But now a bit of a change of pace, because the other organization I need to ask you about is Safe Transitions. Um, I was really quite emotional when I was doing some of the research for this show because it's such an important organization, although it's really, you know, such a shame that we actually need it. So tell us about Safe Transitions. Why did you found it? And perhaps maybe tell us how businesses listening can get involved. For sure. Yeah, this is a really important one. And if you were to ask me how much time I spend on Piper and Sky versus on Safe Transitions, it's maybe it's about half. Um, so I have so much passion for Safe Transitions. And so it came about during, you know, around the beginning of the pandemic when the shelters were largely unseen, you know, by, you know, all the frontline workers for good reason were given, you know, there was a lot of attention focused there, but I've been working with shelters for quite a while, quite a few years now um, to support um, survivors of human trafficking and domestic violence. And so through my supply chain, I was able to have thousands of masks made, cloth masks made and distributed throughout Canada. Um, and so it was through that that I started to learn uh, in my interactions with the shelters that they were operating at such overcapacity and that, you know, due to the stay at home um, orders that uh, many of the abused women were forced to stay home with their abusers. And so the brave uh, and courageous ones that had the guts to go to a shelter uh, and were turned away because they had no room for them. The stats on that are horrific. And so I just started to kind of pick up on this and learn about it and it sort of piqued my interest. And I, I spent some time thinking about how I could maybe get involved or do something. And then it was not much, not long after that, um, I had a buddy of mine who's a property management, property manager. Um, he overheard a phone call and I was talking, talking with one of the shelters. And so, he, it, so long story short, he uh, suggested to me being a property manager that current status in Toronto pandemic, um, he had uh, uh, tons of vacant furnished condos in, in the downtown area. So he said to me, Joe, if you have connections and, and relationships with the shelters and if they are over capacity, maybe we have a, we have a solution here but I would need you to be my, my middleman kind of thing to, with the shelters. And I was like, so I thought about it for maybe a couple hours, <laughs> called them back and I was like, let's do this. We can do, let's just try. And so I would say within a week we had, you know, the uh, nonprofit organize, organization set up um, and we had hired a, a lawyer to help us through, through some of the, you know, just to navigate some of the major overarching questions that I had about this. And we immediately, I would say within a, few weeks we had women coming out of shelters and moving into these one-year lease condos furnished in the Toronto area wow. and 
so that's kind of how it happened and um it's been interesting i've learned a ton uh we've had some really good success stories we have one girl that yeah, came out of the one-year program with us and she went on to back to medical school Wow. and so we have had some really like amazing success stories and then we've had some not so successful stories and i think maybe this is where um other businesses can come in and, and, and maybe you know get involved because what we're doing is we don't just want to set them up in these furnished condos and then send them off to you know good luck <laughs> um and all the best to you without you know setting them up for success and so what we're doing is we're really trying to build resourcing for them and so some of these girls come to the shelters with literally only the clothes on their back and so they may not have life skills such as doing laundry, you know, doing the dishes, um, you know, they may, they may not have an identification, a govern, government issued ID on them. Uh, they might not have, uh, you know, uh, a credit score. And so a lot of them cannot get, cannot even apply for a condo when they leave the shelter. So that's one thing. We help them get their, their documents in order. But what's really cool is, is having people come to us and offer their ex area of expertise um, to, to help us really um, build that resourcing to guarantee the success of these women when they exit our program. And so examples of that are financial planners we've had come forward and offer their time for free to help these women. We've had, you know, uh, holistic nutritionists to help them learn about, you know, healthy eating or cooking healthy for their families. Um, a whole bunch of resourcing that we, you know, um, that we are seeing is crucial to the success of the program. Yeah. And so, you know, even it's, it can be the smallest thing. Someone wants to, you know, uh, train someone on, you know, proper um, hygiene even. Some of these women don't know, uh, have never really learned how to take care of themselves if they come from a, you know, a sex trafficking situation at a very young age. Well, they I just think... have no life skills. And I think like job openings, right? If there's a company out there that p could possibly have job openings, but also, you know, want to train, right? Are open to training and um, getting involved. I think it's an amazing, I like, I can't believe you started that before the pandemic and just hearing some of those success stories and, you know, just congratulations on really digging in and being able to help really um, over the last couple of years when, you know, people really needed that help. And so how do you do everything? Like you have so many things going on. What does your day look like? I think you're going to love what I'm about to tell you because and my <laughs> friends and family are like, no, you're crazy. Like, stop. Don't take on any more new projects. <laughs> But my next, my next goal, my next project that's in the back of my mind is why don't I set up my own factory and train the women from the shelters yep. to make the handbag for me, right? So there you go. There you go. I <laughs> Problem love solved. That. Wow, I love <laughs> that. You can bring the two together. Oh, like you, it's like you bring everything together, man. I just, and <laughs> that's kind of, I don't know about you, but that's kind of the moment where you're like, wait a second. <laughs> That's how this all fits in. Because sometimes people are like, well, you're doing all these things. Like, how do they even relate? And then yes. you have this moment, you're like, that's how they relate. And that's how I'm going to do this. Amazing. 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 Yeah. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. I just, yeah. I'm a risk. I'm a big risk taker. And I kind of just don't, I don't think twice about like taking on a new project. I just kind of, if I get an idea and I uh, think about it, sit on it for a little while. Um, I'll just go for it and I just like nothing stops me and that's just kind of how I credit my parents for that um, they just gave me that confidence get, get out there and do something you know um, make a difference yeah. be yeah. good be kind yeah. you know work hard yeah. <laughs> but have fun <laughs> yeah. so I'm not even going to ask you how you found your voice because I think that just came naturally for you right I mean you know through your parents and what you learned from them and how how you take risks and different things like that did it just come naturally um, you know, to be honest, actually, this this just came to my mind now because um, I had I suspected you might be asking me this question, but um, truly, the honest answer is that I became a competitive Highland dancer at the age of nine, and um, having been born with cleft lip and palate, so a facial deformity, you know, confidence and having like having a voice at all period growing up was an issue for me. Um, but I credit the Highland dance 
uh, the competition and, you know, having to present yourself on stage and compete in, you know, across the globe. Um, that's when I really gained my confidence is through the Highland Dance community and the competitions and the travel. And, um, and that's, that's really where I gained my voice. And then I think it's this just become stronger as I've, uh, in my journey with business and with schooling and with education and courses and black belt, green belt, <laughs> setting up companies that I know nothing about. <laughs> um, it just, it just grew in time. And so now I think I talk too much, but <laughs> no, I don't think you do. Have and a you, and I, you and I could talk for hours. I mean, we have in the past <laughs> and you know that I am a huge supporter of yours. Um, but so I never want to wind down these conversations, but I do want to ask you one last question. Question. What advice do you have for girls and women looking to follow in your footsteps? I mean, you're truly inspiring. There's got to be something of advice that you can leave them with if they want to do something similar to you. Um, you know, that's a tough question, but um, it's really about differentiating yourself in the in w whatever industry it is that you're you're trying to break into. And of course, I chose handbags, which is you know astronomically and exceptionally difficult to break into so you know but I always tell myself and I've heard this said before you know it takes 10 years to be an overnight sensation so you know just um just be patient with yourself because you know oftentimes we're so hard on ourselves and we want to see success right away we want to prove to others that we're successful right away and uh, it's difficult because as entrepreneurs no one's telling us that we're doing a good job. Right. We have to be the ones telling ourselves that, you know, like <laughs> we don't have a boss telling us you got to, you know, you did a great job. Here's your performance review. And so sometimes I, you know, you yearn for that, right? <laughs> no one's telling me I'm doing a good job. So, um, but that's important is that, you know, if you wake up every morning and you're excited to do what you do, that is, you know, that's everything because life is truly so short. And if you wake up in the morning and you stop liking what you do and you stop having fun at it, it's time to change. So I don't see that time coming for myself anytime soon. Um, I'm in it to win it here. So we're going on year six and a half, seven. So I'm giving it three more years. <laughs> I love it. That's such amazing advice. I go through that all the time. And I'm so glad that you said that because as an entrepreneur, I mean, we've got to be our own cheerleaders every single day, even when we don't want to be. I mean, you're such a powerhouse and you've covered so much ground during the course of your career so far with such confidence and hard work. You've worked on the corporate side and taken what you've learned to founding your own organizations. You've straddled business and the arts. You're doing work in the community. I mean, I really do think that you will have inspired a lot of people who are listening today. You certainly continue to inspire me. So thank you, Joanna, for joining me today and telling us all about your story and trusting us to be able to help share your story with the community. Thank you so much, Sarah, for having me. Thank <laughs> you.